A very warm welcome everyone from the Netherlands uh, NTCC office here in the Netherlands uh, Embassy building. As you can see behind us, it's uh, pouring down with rain, which is actually great news because we're going to talk about water management and pumps, etc, etc. Um, this is already the third edition of the NTCC Industry 4.0 webinar series. Talking about webinar, thank you for the overseas viewers. Kun, I see you all the way from uh, Malaysia. Uh, Oretto and uh, Joost from Chiang Mai. So thank you for joining us as well. Uh, we might have a few other uh, participants later. So of course, more than welcome. What we're gonna share today is everything about Megatronics Applied. And the expert about Megatronics will be sitting next to me for the viewers on the left-hand side, uh, for me on the right-hand side or the other way around, <laughs> is actually Remco Flace Dubois. And he's CEO of Kiloscar Thailand here. And uh, he will be explaining and guiding us through this um, exciting technology, which for me is completely new, but I'm sure the viewers have heard of it. And we will probably hear uh, much more about this in the near future. Remco, you have prepared a few slides for us and also some videos. If there are any questions, then please uh, keep them uh, for at the end of the presentation and raise them through the reactions or Q&A button. So we will monitor them if you have some questions. We are actually also uh, being welcomed by a few of our members here in the audience, here in the office. So thank you gentlemen for joining us this afternoon. And uh, without further ado, Remco, I would like to give you the floor. This is the table actually, <laughs> and I will zoom out. And, I always uh, got the floor. <laughs> what I'll do, I will now stop sharing this one and we'll open up your first screen. Is yeah, that okay? That's fine. Right. Welcome everybody. I'll be very excited. Yep. Hello. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, we have the perfect weather. We're going to talk about mechatronics. Uh, what does it mean? And also in relation to later, uh, what we're going to see is the uh, flood prevention. Um, um, sorry, I have to admit. So somebody had joined. That's very good. Uh, about the flood prevention uh, program, the, the Bangkok Metropolitan Authorities implemented in Bangkok. This is a unique solution and it's only possible with the latest technologies uh, applied. So we go step by step from the beginning, a little bit of examples. We have a short time. Uh, I have also a colleague with me, Mr. Aniban. He will do the, the flood prevention uh, project, uh, BMA Bangsu, uh, to give you some more details uh, on that. So. So we talk a little bit about mechatronics. We also talk about the relation between mechatronics and industry 4.0. I think uh, Frank uh, from ZI Arcus explained very well about industry 4.0. We have also very good uh, examples of digital twins and, and, and things like that. And what is the relation of mechatronics to industry 4.0? Is there any relation? Uh, how is mechatronics used in the industry? We have some example of manufacturing some example uh, in the buildings, which you see day to day. And uh, the main thing we're going to talk about is the uh, uh, Bangkok flood protection program done in Bangkok, which is basically an example for the whole world, uh, which would also be only be possible with mechatronics. So what is mechatronics? So mechanical engineering exists since the human beings exist, right? So we invented the wheel, we invented all kinds of other things and humans are lazy by nature. So they try to invent machines to make life more easy. But it's all manual power or powered by natural force like what. So this example of a hand pump, this is existing for a very long time. But it didn't do the job very well. So lucky enough, around 1700s, we start to see the first electrical engineering coming about. Motors, electrical motors and others. And suddenly we can see that this easy hand pump become a fantastic machine uh, with the electric motor can easily provide water to the whole village rather than everybody go one by one to take the water. But it's still it's start and stop. It, it will run as it runs and it's not very smart. Life become already more easy around the 1700s. 
Then we make a quick jump uh, later on because we were missing um, controls. So around uh, 30s, 1930, 40, we see first controls coming along and we start combining these things together. So basically smart machines is called mechatronic where we can combine mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and the controls into one system. And we have some small examples on how that work in manufacturing, day-to-day -day manufacturing, where we can turn easy objects into very smart objects. We will have some examples later on. This. What are the advantages of mechatronics? Why would I do all that, right? So it is very cost-effective. You can produce high quality products. We can think about robots, which is a good example of mechatronics applied, uh, smart bombs. We, we have all kinds of examples day to day as well. Uh, we have a high degree of flexibility to modify or redesign your systems. It will not cost a lot of money to do that. And we have some example later as well. Um, it will ex greater extent of using the machine in full for example, uh, before uh, you go to put, uh, let's say, gasoline in your car and the pump will run uh, and they will have uh, one pump for each uh, station, for each dispenser. And now they can use one pump for all the dispensers. So they can uh, look at the demand and utilize the one machine to the maximum by making it smart. Uh, it's also very reliable, so it can self-diagnose when things are not so good. Uh, so these are all, many of the advantages we can see with uh, mechatronic smart machines. So this is a little bit in a picture. So we see mechatronics in the middle. We have mechanical engineering, we have control system, electronics, and altogether mechatronics. Now, when we connect that to the internet, we have something we call IoT, Internet of Things. Uh, where we can then uh, connect machines together that then can work together. And then we then put data acquisition on top and tools to analyze the data. We are going to think about Industry 4.0, what Frank explained to us is about data, data management, data in the cloud, where we can learn and make things uh, better. So this is the relation between uh, Industry 4.0 and mechatronics. So we have some example of product efficiency to reduce batches to one piece. So you don't have to uh, make high batches to make it economical. You are flexible in your design and we can make very specific solutions for specific problems. It's very cost effective, very fast. And all the parts, we come to look at the Bangsu pump station, which is a unique project. And the parts you will see from the, all the pumps are printed with the machine rather than cast it as normal would be done. So the mechanical part is an arm and a feeder. The electric part is a motor. We have basic ingredients, which is sand and glue, which you can find anywhere around the world. We have controls, software controls like 3D software and CAM. And this created a new tool, which basically is the lar largest 3D printer in the world. And it can mold 3D objects. Uh, which you can then use um, to send to foundries to pour the metal and basically then you have an end product. So with all this new uh, technology, we come to totally new solutions how to produce things. So we have a little example there. We use it in day-to-day uh, -day in our company as well. It's a unique machine and we have a small video on that. is a large format for producing any type of object from particle material using digital data. The system concept features a large wind space of 41211 meters and uses a particularly wide print head that prints a layer in only two passes for parts manufacturing of objects. How it works. Sand mixer 
makes the sand is a chemical and mechanical is a mixture in a movable hopper. Movable hopper distributes sand in sand arm. Sand arm moves towards printer head. Sand arm comes back and distributes sand equally on table. Printer head moves to print forward and backwards. In the meantime, sand arm gets refilled. This cycle repeats till the object is created. In each cycle, the height of the printed block rises 0.3 millimeters. The maximum height of printed block is 1 meter. Once the object is created, table comes out through draw using slider. Unprinted material is recycled and final mold or core is ready for further processing. So this is a good example of uh, mechatronics, where you make total new machines uh, with the new possibilities we have. Um, another mechatronic system, uh, which is a little bit close to what we're doing, is uh, booster pumps in buildings. So people who have a condominium or any small building, they want to go to the toilet, you want to you wanna go to the shower, things like that. Now you think this is very easy, but you will have maybe 50 rooms in a condominium and everybody need to go and have a shower and maybe at the same time so what you look at these systems in condominiums they laid out for maximum water consumption which is not very high uh, efficiency of the product which costs uh, high bills at the end of the uh, month for all the people who, who live there so we have smart uh, what we call booster systems where we have mechanical, the pump, electrical, the motors, and controls, IoT-enabled smart control systems, which can then reduce the energy costs and optimize the water pressure based on the number of people take a shower and data is gathered and learn when most people take a shower in your condominium. So we can optimize the pressure as well as the energy cost consumed. So this is another small example of mechatronics where we make uh, simple products, smart, and have good energy savings. Now, I will introduce you to my colleague soon, Mr. Aliba. Ali, maybe you sit here. And uh, we talk a little bit about Bangsu um, uh, project. This is a project from the Bangkok Metropolitan Administration. And this is a unique uh, project where also we look at me mechatronic in the highest possible way, where there's a lot of water. Today it's also raining heavily also here in the embassy. And uh, there's a lot of water problems. Uh, the Bangkok is below the uh, water level and, and we have many problems with flooding. And Bangkok Metropolitan Authority were not very happy. A, because the people, their houses uh, became flooded. And it's also not good for the election. So they say this government no good, they don't take care of me. So they came with a unique solution to uh, prevent uh, flooding in the city of Bangkok. Uh, this involves tunnel boring, GPS technology, uh, intake uh, management, because there's a lot of rubbish and other things are coming in. It use sensors throughout the tunnel and in the, in the pump house and monitoring. You see electronic controls and a unique long lasting pump technology uh, with concrete foyer pumps. So we will explain a little bit about this project. Uh, how does it work and how the mechatronics are really applied on day to day. And after we have talked about the theory, we go with the group here uh, in the embassy, we will travel down to the actual site where we will see and today it's raining, so the pumps will be running and it's a quite impressive site uh, when you see that. So Mr. Aniban, who's the 
product expert of Kiloska, and he has done also the project management for this particular project, who gave you some insight in mechatronics applied within this unique solution. And this is copied all over the world. Man, people are looking now in uh, Jakarta, Vietnam, India, and other places around the world to do similar projects like this. Yeah? yeah. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm here to talk about this project that we have done with, uh, with Bangkok Metropolitan Administration. Uh, it's called the uh, Bangsu Drainage Pumping Station. This project is very unique. Uh, this is not the first one that BMA did, BMA as in Bangkok Metropolitan Administration, but this project is different from the other ones. The first one that was done way back in probably 2000 was a fully manual pumping system where there's an operator who has to manually press the button and manually open the valves. And then we have not that that's in Makassan, which is in Ramanayan area. And then we have one in Makassan. Uh, uh, that is where we have one in Prakanong uh, down Sukhumvet, which is a semi automatic version. And then we have ours which is uh, which is intelligent pumping system because it's it's all controlled by level sensors this pumping station is unique because we are pumping 60 cubic meters per second to put that into perspective that is 60000 liters per second so when it rains in bangkok for more than 30 minutes most of the narrow streets of bangkok is underwater we all are aware of that this pumping station basically relieves six districts of Bangkok from floodwaters. Whenever it rains for more than 30 minutes, this pumping station will basically come into action. When the pump runs for more than 15 minutes, the water levels go drastically uh, down in six districts in Bangkok. So we are pumping 60,000 liters a second. The total kilowatt is 12,000 kilowatt. That's again a very big number. Uh, we are talking of concrete volute pumps. Uh, one pump is probably uh, half the size of the room and we have fitted six pumps in a space of 40 meters. This pumping station is next to a temple, uh, is next to a palace and is right alongside a residential area uh, the noise level of the pumping station is below 75 dBA. So the people around the pumping station wouldn't even know. The only, the only thing that they would probably be knowing is probably the electricity would dim a little <laughs> bit nearby their houses because, because uh, there wasn't enough space for BMA to make a substation. So we are actually taking electricity from the pole. <laughs> so that's the only impact uh, that, that the residents of the area would actually see. So what basically is the concept is uh, 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 this project uh, we did with BMA, uh, 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 the contractor, the main contractor was Navarat Patanakan, and the application is uh, storm water drainage. Uh, so what happens is uh, we have intake stations, right? So whenever it rains, in all the districts of Bangkok, we have intake stations and the water, the rainwater would, would basically go and go to the intake station and then would flow into a tunnel. The tunnel, in the tunnel, it's about six kilometers long along six provinces of uh, six districts of Bangkok. And then all the water would come to the pumping station. And then our pumps would basically pump the water out into, into the Chakra River. Uh, we have to use a pump there because all these six districts of Bangkok are below the water level of Chakra River. So the river is actually at a higher level. So the pump, so the water can't go by gravity. It has to be pumped. So that's basically the concept. So we are looking at Rajtapisek. Uh, there's one intake in Rajtapisek Road. Uh, there's one in Vipavati, Rangsit. Uh, there is one in Kampung Pet. And then there is the pumping station, which is in Bangsu. And then uh, uh, there is a discharge tunnel in which basically uh, 
transfers all the water into the river. So Rush Tapisek, Vipavati, and Kampanthet, uh, which is basically Chatuchak area, are all heavily, heavily uh, uh, populated uh, districts uh, of Bangkok. And this pumping station basically helps the residents of these areas from, uh, from flooding. Uh, it's a small animation uh, which shows how the system works. So that's basically flood water, which goes into the tunnel. And from the tunnel, it comes into the pump station. And from the pump station, we pump it into another shaft through an underground tunnel into the river. So that's the concept. Uh, that's how uh, all the flood water is basically channelized uh, into, the, into the river. Uh, this is the pump house. So we have six pumps there. Each is uh, 10 cubic meters per second. That is 10,000 liters a second. So in total, we are pumping 60 cubic meters per second. Well, actually, we are doing 68, uh, a little bit more than what, uh, what BMA wanted. So that's good. And uh, uh, the product that we have used here is, is a concrete volute pump, uh, which, is, uh, which is different from a conventional volute pump because the casing of the pump is, is made out of concrete. And we, we produce and we, and we cast the concrete at site. Uh, we, we don't cast it in the factory, we don't do that. We just pour the concrete at site. And then of course the impellers and the internals of the, part, of the pump, everything comes from the factory. The good thing about the product is, uh, this is a very high life cycle pump. I mean, the efficiencies are all very high, upwards of 88%. Uh, uh, the speed of the pump is around 300 RPM, so that's a really low speed pump. So very little maintenance, very little wear and tear. There are just four move, there are just four parts in the pump that rotate. So no spare parts, nothing. I mean, it's it's really really good. Uh, in term and then and then we have a gearbox, uh, and then on top we have a motor. Uh, this is the this is the pump part, but the whole system is basically controlled by sensors. So we have sensors at the intake, we have sensors. On, in the Chapraya River, we have sensors in the tunnel, and 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 we have set up the the pump station on automatic mode, right? Of course, there are, there are operators who are there uh, in the pump station to to look to monitor the the operation of the pumps, but it basically runs on autopilot mode, basically. So so when it rains, uh, if there is a flood in certain part of Bangkok, the the sensor would trigger, and and the pump would start running, whether it's one pump, two pump, everything has been controlled, can be controlled by, by, by PLC SCADA, by sensors. So uh, I believe today uh, the pumps would be running because it's rained uh, quite a lot. And uh, we can see the practical demonstration of, uh, of sensors and pumps and motors all come together in, a, in, in, in this pumping station. And I believe when we go there, we will have uh, we can exchange ideas to go to next level of uh, mechatronics. You know, there are so many, there's, there's so much of scope for new technologies to come into uh, that, that we can then collectively uh, propose to, to BMA and uh, other government uh, authorities to have a look at. That would be really nice. Okay, that's all from my side. Yeah, we have a small video on the pump. Ah, we have a small video on the pump, yes. Rapid industrialization and urban growth have increased the need for a greater amount of water at different places, for which larger centrifugal pumps are required. Manufacturing such large centrifugal pumps was a challenge, as the use of huge quantities of metal for making the casings and precisely machining the components was both costly and time-consuming. Also, the availability of steel in such large quantities depends on the world market scenario. It was the scarcity of steel post World War I that fueled the need to use reinforced concrete in the volute casing of the centrifugal pump instead of steel. Kirloskai Brothers Limited, one of the largest manufacturers of centrifugal pumps in the world, has developed, supplied, and commissioned a number of concrete volute pumps for different duties which are working satisfactorily. Mm. 
need for concrete volume pump. The problems which were associated with conventional metallic pumps were large casing had to be split for large size casting, machine limitation due to larger size of components, heavy material handling during trial operation, difficulty in transportation to the site, time consuming and hard to perform maintenance. The concrete volume pump begins with detailed engineering. Placement of wooden formwork for suction draft tube. Placement of shroud holder ring. Placement of wooden formwork for volume. ready for concreting. After successfully concreting of the draft tube, the metallic components are critically positioned. Lowering the impeller and rotating assembly. Placement of intermediate shaft. And finally, drive motor for pump install on motor foundation block. Operating range of concrete volume pump. Head up to 15 meters. Capacity up to 1,20,000 cubic meters per hour. <laughs> Delivery size up to 6,000 mm. Speed 150 to 600 RPM. Applications of the concrete volume pump. Concrete volume pumps are preferred for applications where a large quantity of water is required to be handled and are suitable for seawater applications as only a few dynamic and metallic parts are in contact with the water. Also, there is an added advantage due to the use of concrete as it provides excellent corrosion resistance in seawater. Concrete volume pumps find application mostly as thermal and nuclear power plants and in large irrigation projects, water supply schemes, dry docks, drainage and flood control, and desalination projects. Kiloskar concrete volume pump unique features. Unmatched reliability, almost 99.95%. No standby pump required. Sustainable efficiency over a longer period. Ideal for sea or brackish water. No erosion and or corrosion because of special coro coat coating. Lowest maintenance cost, lowest operating cost. Robust anti-seismic in situ construction, integral with pump house. Full accessibility, easy internal inspection without dismantling the impeller. Lower construction cost, estimated life of 15 years. India's first set of concrete volume pumps have been supplied by KBM and are running uninterruptedly without any standby pump since the last two decades. High reliability, design simplicity, excellent corrosion resistance, and superior operating performance have led to better hydraulic performance and ease of maintenance. This has led to concrete volume pumps being the most economical and most preferred pumps used in cooling water systems. Concrete volume pumps, Concrete Solutions from Kirloska Brothers Limited. <laughs> That's how they went. So we want to share a little bit on the mechatronic uh, side. So we can see 
applications in manufacturing, in day-to-day -day life, and also in bigger solutions like flood prevention. You will find solutions all over the industry. And uh, this is a little bit what we had to share because we have a very short period of time. And uh, we're very exciting to show everybody in reality how it looks like and what it does to day-to-day -to -day life by keeping the Bangkok dry, basically. And that's what we try to do. Good. Nice. Well, I could imagine there might be a question from the audience here in the embassy. If there is, then now is the time, gentlemen, if you have a question. Otherwise, we'll park it for our visit later. Somebody has a question, perhaps? There are no questions from the... Uh, what market. capacity do you use? Uh, we could use concrete pumps for, for smaller capacities as well. But uh, we normally say, I mean, anything less than anything less than five cubic meters per second, uh, concrete volume will not probably be the best. So anything upwards of five cubic meter per second, concrete volume is more economical mm -hmm. in terms of uh, manufacturing cost and in terms of operating costs. That should be the break even, that should be the point, five cubic meters per second. Do you use special concrete? To just, just, just normal concrete. Portland, Portland cement, yeah. yeah? yeah. No, the, the uh, speed is very low. Yeah. The velocity of the of the water inside uh, the volute is not very high. Yes. We have to design the whole system. I mean, we design the intakes in a way that we are able to reduce the water velocity even before the water enters the pump. And then when it's going through the pump, of course, the velocity would increase because it's a rotating equipment, right? But then uh, 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 we have... Uh, uh, before we pour the concrete, we we have the bar, we have the reinforcement, which we use uh, iron bars basically to reinforce. So we have we have to design that as well. So we make sure that there are more iron bars in that area of the pump where the water velocities are high. But the concrete is just normal Portland cement. Yeah, it should be fine. The speed very low. Yeah. Also, because the pumps need to be fish friendly. It sounds funny ah. <laughs> because the the fish. If you pump water from rivers or canals or things like that, there's also fish there and other kind of life, and we have to protect it. So we cannot run on high speed, and all the fish would die. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in Thailand, maybe they will not care too much, but in Holland, you can't do that anymore. So the, the pump needs to be what they call fish friendly, mm -hmm. and many fish die not because of the speed of the pump, but because the stress they had going through the pump. And uh, with 300 RPM, the fish will be very uh, happy and relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> so we relax the fish a little bit on these also. <laughs> it sounds funny, but you need to think about this kind of environmental impact on your product as well. The volume is quite low, but Yeah, sure. If you increase the speed, you yeah. can pump much more than that. But it's also about the intake, because the intake is managed very well. Yes. And it needs to be calculated because you can imagine when you have six pumps and one goes on automatic and you don't manage it, then all the water comes maybe to one pump and the other pump have almost no water and the first pump have too much water. So we will distribute the water to all the pump stations okay. equally. Yes. Mm -hmm. in, in this project, which yeah, is uh, just now a state of composition, basically, compared to maybe in the past more like the operator system where yeah, they get some news that there is uh, some flooding and you have to... So what were the challenges uh, to, uh, to, to propose a completely new uh, system, a new uh, loss piece compared to... Uh, and, and what were the challenges you had with that implementing? The challenges were basically, as you rightly said, uh, is, is basically hooking up the sensors and all and, and basically, you know, installing the sensors correctly and, make sh and making sure that the, that the signals are all good. And then uh, and the pump is able to, and, and then the control panel is able to you know, receive the sensor signals properly and then instruct the pump to start or to stop. That was one challenge. Uh, the other challenge that we faced was uh, to, to uh, to measure the flow, that was a big challenge for us. We just couldn't find 
a solution how to how to have a good flow meter to to accurately measure how much of water we are discharging into the river and then uh, we had to look around a lot we found the technology coming out of france uh, then we had to integrate that that's a radar based uh, system we had then we then had to integrate that into the into the into the pumping scheme and then uh, luckily we were able to do that and it works very well i mean bma were very happy to see that because before this they only had zero and then six pumps run 60 but now they can see the 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 the, the water discharge from zero building up one two three four five six all the way up to 64 68 cubic meters per second they can control it they can see it uh, they can they can learn the patterns they can learn that during during the summertime how much water they are discharging during the during the rainy season like like like, like this time how much of water they are discharging into the river they can they can use the data to analyze and they can use the data to to basically decide and and design more efficient and better systems uh, elsewhere around Bangkok. So, so yeah, integrating the electronics was uh, was quite a challenge. The most difficult part of it. What was the lead time of the whole project from start to finish? Uh, from start to we 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 the project started uh, two thousand and fourteen, and we handed over. I mean, the main contractor on our uh, they handed over the project to BMA in two thousand and seventeen end. Okay. So about three years. And of that, how much time did it take you to, to physically build the pump itself? Uh, well, our, our, our part was done in about one and a half years. Uh, the pump station was about a year and a half. And then uh, remaining, I mean, they were doing it parallelly because they also had to, had to make a tunnel, which was around six, which is around six and a half kilometers long. So that was, that took majority of the time. But now I think with, with new technology, we are able to complete the pumping station in less than one year. Less than one year. What was the fact that it can run all through this and you can use the same sort of and was that a requirement from the RFQs? Uh, the RFQs, uh, the RFQs just mention what BMA wants. They just mention I want this much of water to be channelized, oh, so but they will not specifically write that I want this many sensors. I want that many. No, they don't. That they leave uh, onto the main contractors and and the suppliers like us to 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 decide. But yes, along the along the during the course of the project, we have to get approvals from them. So we decide, we design, and then we get an approval, and then we implement. That's what it is. Right. Well, thank you very much, audience, for asking these questions. Uh, on behalf of the NTCC community, we have a small goodie bag for well, the gentlemen. Always good. Thank you, yeah. thank you both, for sharing uh, this knowledge with us. Thank you, Kun, for zooming in from Malaysia. This might be a solution for KL. I'm sure you have some water there as well. Uh, Ruth Royal Haskoning, our previous uh, webinar host. Uh, hopefully, this has been also of interest to you. Joost as well. Thank you, Roberto, for joining us. We're gonna check out whether these pumps are doing their work. So we're heading over to Bangsu and to check whether it's dry. So we're not only thanking the both of the gentlemen for this presentation, but also to keep our city dry and hopefully in the future, other cities and other areas as well. Yes. So thank you all for joining. Thank you here for joining us as well. And um, as always, hope to see you next time. And next time in this series of the uh, Industry 4.0, we will share with you interesting techniques from KUKA Robotics. Uh, that will be hosted on the 30th of September. So please stay tuned. You will be getting our emails and you can log in. And thank you for participating today and wish you all a lovely day. Bye-bye.